let's go. 10 plus zero, slightly shorter video for today. Let's get the show on the road. Okay, so we're playing a serious player, 2338. Welcome to the people watching on YouTube. It is December 21, almost 3 a.m., so take it easy on me. All right, so for some reason, this Peter and a lot of people have been aborting on move one. This is not particularly promising. Very complex position. Let's start analyzing. So there's a new move that I was recently made aware of, which is actually C7, C5. It's an absolutely revolutionary idea um, because all of the experts say that E5 is the only feasible move. Well, there we go. He's following the experts. <clears throat> okay, spotting us 40 seconds. Fantastic. So we have two options in response to Knight C6. <clears throat> we have the Glex system, which I've played quite a bit, and we have the Relopez. A lot of people have been requesting in the comments section and through my stream a game in the Relopez against a high-level opponent which is what I'm gonna do. This time, we're gonna play the Rui Lopez and we are facing a very well-known sideline. I think this is called the bird variation. It's a very old line. It's, it's, been around for, it's been around for a while. And essentially, it's what I would call a third-rate sideline. But the benefit of such a move, knight takes d4 is <clears throat> essentially forced, is that most Rui Lopez players just like don't study these types of sidelines carefully or if they have studied them, it's been a long time since they've reviewed the line, and I am among that number. I haven't reviewed this in many, many years. I vaguely remember that Castle's Kingside is supposed to be the best move, but that's essentially all that I know. Because we're playing a 10-minute game, I don't really have time to delve into the sort of generalities of this variation. That's what we're going to do after the game. What I remember is that the bishop is supposed to drop back to c4 rather than to a4, as is standard in the main line of the Rui Lopez. Knight f6, and I vaguely remember the line e5, which is meant by d5. So we're gonna avoid e5, and instead we're gonna play d3. Play it solid, protect the center, and prepare to develop the bishop, d5. All right, well, taking seems pretty normal. Knight takes d5. And we should invest a moment here to try to understand if we can punish black for keeping the king in the center this long. The move rookie one check should be essentially everybody's instinct. Black will likely meet it with bishop e7. And the second major weakness in black's position, of course, is the d4 pawn, which may look imposing, but it's actually a very serious weakness because if black ever plays c5 to protect that pawn, then the knight on d5 is going to become weak. So black's position is... Very flimsy. But in order to punish it, we have to play accurately here. Let's think about this. So actually, I like the move knight to d2 here quite a bit. Hmm. Okay, let me think. Here, here, here. There's a lot of promising continuations here. Okay. We're going to play very positionally here. We're going to go rookie one check. We're going to play very, very positionally. <clears throat> I didn't find anything tactical that I liked. Instead, we're going to opt for what I hope to be a relatively small but nagging and stable advantage, which is perfect for this kind of time control. We're going to trade off the dark squared bishops. We're going to trade off the dark squared bishops, and as a result, black is left with a very lame light squared bishop on e6. And now we also have the option of taking on d5 and doubling, doubling black's pawns. <clears throat> so... That seems promising. On the other hand, yes, black pawns are doubled, but the C file opens up and this backward pawn on C2 could be pressured by black's rook. So it's not entirely obvious that bishop takes D5 is best here. Let's take another moment. I'm investing a lot of time here, but I think it's very important for us to play accurately to secure our advantage. The other option is to complete our development with knight D2. Okay, let's go for knight D2. Maybe I'll change my mind after he castles. He castles queenside, okay. I honestly didn't see that at all. I didn't even realize that that was legal. Now it's an extremely risky move. Now it, it dawns on me that I should have taken on d5 because now black will recapture with the rook. Now we kind of have to opt for plan b and pressure this pawn. How are we going to do that? Well, probably we should do it from b3. But then queen g5 is very scary. 
But on knight f3, he's got queen f6. Maybe we can jump into e5 there. Hmm. Yeah, I'm sort of feel like I'm misplaying this. All right, let's go knight b3. Let's go knight b3. Very mm -hmm. spicy position. C5. Okay. Extremely weakening move. Now queen f3 leaps to mind. But somehow we might not have enough firepower to make anything happen. If we And if we can't make anything happen, then black's position is fundamentally sound. Black doesn't actually have any weaknesses. Yeah, it was a big mistake, I think, not to take on d5 when I had a chance. I just missed... I just missed Long Castle. Okay, Queen C7. I'm gonna have to speed up a little bit here. We could trade Queens. We could send the A pawn down the board. Let's go A4. Let's go A4 for starters. It's not a very committal move. Yeah, we're weakening the B4 square, but I'm not too concerned about that. Okay, Bishop G4, is that a threat? Eh, it's not really a threat because we can drop the Queen away to G3. Let's continue with a5. Okay, let's throw in the move a6, probably, to weaken his king side. Yes, let's throw in a6. It's going to go b6. And then we're going to go... Are we going to go h3 and allow g5? Am I getting crushed here? Okay, let's go h3. All right. No, I'm not getting crushed. Still feels like white is better. It feels like if he moves his knight, he's going to get mated. Okay, I guess not. Knight f4, that is a strange move. Okay, this knight on b3 is not doing anything. The check on a8 is not effective as of yet. I feel like we should keep that in our pocket. So, okay, let's go knight d2. Let's go knight d2. Trying to reroute the knight toward the center. And keeping the tension. I, I want to trade on our, on our terms. If he takes on c4, that's amazing, because that helps our knight get to an excellent square. Okay, now it feels like we're taking over the initiative, but I don't have a lot of time. So maybe now we should take, but then he takes with the pawn. Hmm. Okay, let's take, just for the sake of simplicity. Takes with the pawn, okay. All right, now is it time for us to... Well, first of all, it's time to move. Let's get our knight into the action. I like this move more than knight e4 because it keeps the diagonal open for the queen. And it sets up the potential for maybe knight takes b6 if the black queen moves away. Also, of course, the main idea. Okay, I expected this. Wait a minute. Knight takes b6, queen takes b6, and rook a3 is a pretty incredible idea, but it doesn't quite work because he has king c7, rook b3, and he takes, he gets away. Okay, okay. Speed up, speed up. There is knight e5, and there is rook a3. Rook a3. Now, very important detail. If he plays rook to d5, trying to block the diagonal, we have rook takes e6, removing the guard. Obviously, okay, he goes back to c8. Wait, now this has to be losing. He's playing for the clock here. It's very, very clear to me. Okay, here, we, let's not rush. Let's Let's think. There, there, there. There's just so much to calculate here. I don't understand how he's playing so quickly. Amazingly, I just don't see the force to win here just yet. Okay, here. God, I'm, I'm, I, on every move, I keep trying to find the force to win, and I keep not finding it. And as a result, I'm burning like a ton of clock. I might lose this game on time, because now again, check, king d7, knight e5, queen e5, and he's winning? God, how is this? This is crazy. Okay, queen up. Uh, that was a bad move. He wasn't actually threatening anything. I should have gone rook a1. That was really stupid. Okay, rook a1. Now it's going to get spicy. Because I'm threatening knight takes b6. Finally, I have a threat. Finally, I have a threat. Okay, he defends with king d7. But now... What is this? This is just crazy play by our opponent. Check. Picking up rook e1. Getting the rook back into the action. I want to go c3. Rook f5. Okay, now check he has to go back to d7. Okay, I think we should go c3 here. God, this is going to be so interesting to analyze. That's the positive of this game. But this is so nerve-wracking. Because also, it's so easy to miss a tactic here for white. Okay, goes takes. Should I go d4? No, we should take with the rook. Get the rook into the attack. Much more important than pawn structure. God, he's, he's just trying to flag me. 
Okay. Let's go d4, open up the center. He can't move the knight. That's that's huge. If he moves the knight, he walks into knight c4 wait. Now, now he's dead lost. Okay, now we take, open up the d file. Okay, he has to take, and then b4 is probably winning. Can I go for a sacrifice here? Knight c4, king d7. God, it's uh, it's crazy how hard it is to find the force to win here. Um, b4, I think, is winning. Rook d1, knight d5, and he's surviving. Okay, let's go b4. Let's go b4. This guy has like 8,000 lives. Rook b5. Rook d1, knight d5, still surviving. What the heck? I don't get this. He's, he's actually going to win if I don't. Knight d5, yeah? No, but I take a knight c4. Did I get it? I got it, I think. Knight c4. Yes, we got him. Check. Holy smokes. And I take on e6. But it's still not over. He has king b5. But knight d6. Yes. Bang. We win. Oh my gosh. Mom spaghetti. Yeah, okay. But now with 30 seconds, I'll, I'll win this pretty easily, I think. Plenty of time. I just need like one or two accurate moves here. We're going to go after the a7 pawn and combine it with an attack against the king. Rook b1. Obviously still need to be fast and accurate here. Okay, the goal is to play rook b7. He's probably going to go e5. <laughs> You're always allowed to give subs. Okay, up to b7 we go. If possible, we're going to trade the rooks, but the priority is to go after this pawn. Yeah, queen a7. He's, he might give us a check. Just watch out for the knight getting to f1, because that is a perpetual mechanism. Um, king c6. Okay, back to b1. And that's it. Too many threats. Whew. What a game. What a crazy game. Kudos to our opponent for, like, defending like an absolute beast. I really, really did my best to play accurately. I didn't just want to throw pieces at him. And as a result, it, it almost cost me the game on the clock. Okay, here we can give a check and push a7. No, the Rui Lopez can be very tactical. The clinical way to win this... Okay, this is just mate. The clinical way to win this is to get rid of his knight ASAP. If you get rid of his knight, then you can pre-move everything and win. Okay, I actually don't have pre-move enabled, but it, I have enough time. Now we just bang it out. We take h4, we promote a second queen, and we ladder checkmate him. Actually, the fact that I don't have pre-moves enabled is a slight problem. If I had, like, five seconds. Yeah, he's, like, trying to ice the kicker. Like, waiting five, ten seconds to make a move, hoping that I, like, take my foot off the gas pedal, but it's not going to work. I have way, way, way enough time. I can actually just chill. Okay, sorry, YouTube people, this is slightly boring, but hey, it's part of the experience. I'm just going to close my eyes. No, I'm not. I'm going to close my eyes and move when I hear the sound. Okay, it's a little bit scary. No, I, wouldn't, I, I don't want to enable free moves because I'll get stuck. Okay, there we go. Man, mate. Cool. GG. Okay, 63 moves, but in reality, the, the bulk of the game lasted 37 moves. Yeah, what a game. Okay, let me load this into chess space because we are definitely going to need the engine to decipher how many... And I'm sure that there were a million mistakes in the tactical portion of the game. Okay, let me see if I have any books on on the Rui Lopez. Sebastian, if I do, I do have various books. Yes, perfect. So if there are any people like over 2,000 watching this and you want a very high-level book on the Rui Lopez, it's uh, Daria Schwirch, the Polish GM who lives in, in St. Louis. Uh, he wrote a two-volume series uh, pretty recently, 2021, that is excellent. And a lot of people ask, like, oh, how do you use opening books? Like, are opening books good? At my level, opening books are mostly like a reference, right? It's like a dictionary. Like, do you read a dictionary? No, presumably, um, unless you're participating in the spelling bee. 
what do you use a dictionary for? Well, you, you use it to look up a word. And that's exactly the way that I would use a opening book that I consider to be reliable. Like somebody played a line against me. I either don't know the line or I want to refresh uh, the right course of action rather than analyzing on my own in chess space. Using a book is just an easy way to have the information spoon fed to you. Um, same with the chess book course, but I like the old school way of finding it in a book. Right? There's a certain charm to it that I think makes it fun. So let's see what Darius has to say on the bird. This is a pretty big section. His section on the bird's defense, just so you know, is 11 pages. The font's pretty big, but that's just how thorough he is. So a little history. If we look at uh, reference, this move was first played in 1848. Oh, 1856 by Howard Staunton. Howard Staunton actually played this twice in 1856 and 1858. Uh, Bird himself played it many, many times uh, in the 1860s and 70s. That's where it got the name. And uh, a lot of the early good players, Chigorin has some games here. Rudolf Spielmann, Nimzovich, Alakine. Yeah, back in the old days, this was a really popular move. And this is a very like independent line. It doesn't resemble anything at all. This structure is reached exactly in no other line in the Rui Lopez. So in a sense, this game is like a false Rui Lopez. This line stands on its own. And there's a couple of lines in the Rui Lopez that stand on their own. Another one, of course, is the uh, Schliemann or the Janish with F5. Most of the other lines lead to sort of the typical, maybe the Berlin endgame. I think the Berlin endgame also falls into that category of, yeah, it's a Rui Lopez, but this is like a standalone you know, standalone variation. It's like a country within a country. Um, but most of the other lines, like whether you go main line with a6 or d6, you get this sort of typical Rui Lopez structure. But still, knight d4 is a very important move to know. Now, if you're an Italian player, you might be aware of a very famous opening trap uh, the Blackburn Schilling Gambit. Knight d4 is possible against bishop c4. It's a very bad move if white simply takes the knight. You essentially get a Rui Lopez bird up a tempo. Uh, but the unsuspecting player will take on e5. Who knows the entirety of this famous opening trap? Who wants to spell it out in the chat? If you're watching on YouTube, you can demonstrate your knowledge by banging this out on the board next to you. Correct. Queen to g5. White gobbles up f7 with a fork. White gets excited. I've seen this all play out in a lot of uh, kids' games. Queen takes g2. So you say, no problem. Let me just move the rook to f1, and now I'm going to calmly take your rook in the corner. Nope. Check. And does black win the queen? No. It's mate on f3. A lot of online games have gone like this. But in any case, if you're an Italian player, do not take on e5. Just castle or take on d4. All right, so bishop b5, knight d4. Now let's get to the, uh, now let's get down to business. Here's what Darius says. Bird's defense is considered as a slightly suspicious line, but it is nonetheless essential to know how to react with white in order to get an advantage. In 2013, I played a game against Report, who was a specialist in this line, and I did not react well and quickly got myself into trouble. And this is the misconception about these quote-unquote bad lines, right? They're actually not that terrible if you don't react accurately to them, which is why even GMs sometimes surprise other GMs with an objectively dubious line in the hopes that they haven't reviewed it in a while. So Darius gives takes, takes, and castles. And here Black has a couple of options. Um, the most popular move is bishop c5, closely followed by c6. These are essentially the only two legitimate moves. Against bishop c5, Darius gives the immediate bishop c4. And uh, this sets uh, the obvious tactical trap, bishop f7 and queen h5. And here's a quick overview of some variations that Darius gives. This is like a, a very, very thorough analysis. Okay, so d6 is by far the most obvious move. He also gives queen h4, which is not scary because after d3, knight e7, this queen can be chased away, knight d2, castles, and bishop drops back to b3. Bishop drops back to b3. The point is so that d5 uh, does not come with tempo. And then you're going to go f4 and knight f3, chasing away the queen with a great position. Okay, so queen h4 is not scary. Everybody's going to go knight f6. Then you can already go e5, and black is totally busted. Because 
if Black tries to play d5 in this position, this is obviously like a much inferior version because after it takes takes, we can simply take on g7 and then throw the queen up to h5 and we win the game on the spot. So that's terrible. Black has to go d6 first. Now we play d3. And here the main line is c6. So as I understand it, the basic idea is that this knight is going to develop to d2. And we're going to play on the king side in one of several ways. I'm also noticing that Darius really likes the idea of dropping the bishop back to b3 proactively uh, so that black doesn't have like these various tempo moves like b5 uh, and, and d5. If black plays knight f6, we have bishop g5 with a really nice pin. If black plays queen e7, then we start running the f-pawn up the board. And uh, we just run the pawn up to f5 and close off the bishop. The moment the knight moves away, we start assembling pieces on the king side with a huge attack. Queen f8, now simply knight d2. Wow, king, e king d7, bishop e6 check. Black is getting crushed. MVL against David Howell, 2009. Very nice. Okay, so after black plays c6, we drop the bishop back to b3, knight f6, and h3. White stops bishop g4 and knight g4 and keeps all options in hand. In my opinion, white is slightly better. Dariush gives a5, a4, obviously. Castles, now the bishop comes out. Bishop e6 and knight d2 plus equals. I believe white is at least slightly better here. The pin is very annoying. Potential for a kingside attack exists with f4, and it's unclear what black is doing here. Clear enough. Okay, now I skipped over a lot of sidelines and variations. But this is the overview against bishop c5. So bishop c5, you drop the bishop back to, to c4, you push d3, bishop b3 and h3 are good prophylactic moves. The dark squared bishop goes out to g5, and the knight should be developed to d2. And we keep in mind the idea of pushing f4. Okay, now we get to the, the fun part. Our opponent's move was c6. Okay, bishop c4, I assume, is correct. And knight f6 is indeed the main line. Um, Dariush also gives d5, but this looks like a terrible move. Takes, takes, and bishop b5 check with a great position. That's just not not serious. So knight f6 is the only serious option. d3 exclamation mark. Okay, so I managed to follow Dariush's recommendation. After careful analysis, I came to the conclusion that this is the simplest path to an advantage. Okay, so main line for black here is indeed d5. We're literally following the main line from Dariush's books. If black plays the calmer approach, d6, then we already kind of know how to play this position, right? We start with knight d2, then he gives h3, white prepares knight f3, and white is better. Castles, knight f3, c5, and rook e1. White has several plans available. We can push c3, we can push e5. White's position is very, very pleasant here. Okay. So this is also not particularly dangerous. The principled move is d5. Takes, takes, rook e1 check. Still following, uh, still following Darius's recommendation. Bishop e7. If black plays bishop e6, we drop the queen into h5, threatening rook takes e6. Queen d7, bishop takes d5. And Darius actually says that this endgame is really good for white because the weak d4 pawn is very likely to fall. How should white meet rook c8? Quick exercise to make sure that people have not fallen asleep yet. What should white do in this position? It looks like black has beaten us to the punch, but no. Yeah, knight b3 or knight f3. Rook takes c2, knight takes d4, and we win a pawn. The rook has to drop back. We take the knight, we take the bishop, we take the pawn. The rook comes back to e2, stopping rook c2, and we are simply a healthy pawn up in the endgame. Very concrete line, very important to know. So after bishop e7, Darius gives bishop g5. I'm actually pretty pumped. I managed to find like all of the moves up to this point. So my, my long thinks did not go in vain. And now let me explain a little bit how I was able to, how I approached this position. So far, all of my moves have been incredibly natural, but bishop g5 might not be the mo like the first thought that people have. The point of this move is, is not to try to win the game quickly, right? This is the misconception that a lot of people would have. You might look at this move and say, oh, I'm trying to like go after e7. Actually, this is a very positional move. My point was that if black castles, 
which is actually uh, Darius's main move, I wanted to trade on e7 and play knight t2. And my thought was that our bishop is much, much better than its counterpart. The center is wide open and we have the e-file. And white is just like positionally better. Darius gives knight g6, queen h5, plus minus. White has control over the e-file, more active pieces, pressure against the d4 pawn, many, many plans. White is much, much better. So that was simply the idea. All right, so our opponent plays bishop e6, and this move is not given by Darius. Uh, this is the first move that Darius does not consider. There are seven games in the database, so we're still following some games. Bishop takes e7, queen takes e7, and this is a critical moment. And here I made a relatively serious error, I think. And I'm checking the engine. Knight d2 still maintains a clear advantage, but a nearly decisive advantage could have been reached with bishop d5, cd5, and knight d2. And, and somehow, I guess I just didn't appreciate how good this position is. But, but once I look at it on the board, it, it becomes very, very clear why black is in so much trouble. So I was worried about the pressure on c2, but... Rook c8 doesn't even create a threat. Once the d4 pawn falls, our knight is going to be an absolute monster on that square, and the bishop is going to be lame for the rest of the game. So this is just a nearly decisive positional advantage. Black is likely to castle. We're going to go knight b3. Okay, obviously black has to try to defend the pawn. And here, there's a very, very nice plan. Look at what the engine gives. Queen to e2. What is the idea of this move? Who can tell me? There's actually two ideas, but... The one I want you to name is the straightforward one. The idea is to play queen e5, very good, and win the d4 pawn. So black's response is forced, rook a to c8. Now we start by playing rook a to c1, reinforcing the threat of queen e5. There's one game in the database where black goes rook to c6, and now queen to e5 is good, but black has this very tricky idea to get the rook to b6 and tie the knight down. So an even better approach, according to the computer, is to fianchetto the queen on f2. f3, for example, rook fc8, and you literally pre-move queen f2. And finally, black plays rook b6. And who can tell me the final piece of the puzzle? No, actually, there's two more pieces of the puzzle. Look at the battle, the epic battle around the d4 pawn. Black is trying everything to keep that pawn protected. Okay, why can't we play knight d4? Because the b2 pawn falls. Don't be afraid to play the straightforward move, right? This is the basic idea. Don't be afraid to play a quote-unquote dumb straightforward move if it solves the main problem that you're facing. No, but c3 er eradicates black's weakness. You don't want to go c3 because not only does it blunder a pawn, it, it gets rid of the pawn that you're trying to win. Rook b1. Simply rook b1. If black goes back to c6, then we already pick up d4. Black's only way to defend the pawn is rook b4. We get the rook to a terrible square. And the final piece of the puzzle is this move f4. Mission accomplished. Rook e5 is unstoppable. And this move works just the same way that queen e5 did. The d4 pawn will fall, and black is just losing. Like h6, for example, rook e5. That's it. Knight takes d4 is coming. So pretty incredible. This is move 22. This line, I would argue, is almost forced. Because what else is black going to do, right? Black has to castle. Black has to defend the pawn. Queen f6 is the most logical way uh, to, to do that. I guess queen h4 is also possible. Yeah, here we can go like queen d2 and then stick the rook on e5. This queen is just going to be super misplaced. Um, queen b4, we can just chase the queen away. Yeah, queen e2, rook c1. Look at how we're combining prophylactic moves and, and active moves. Right? Rook c1 is prophylactic. F3 furthers our plan. Prophylactic. And now A3, prophylactic, getting the rook to a bad square, and F4 followed by rook E5. So really, really interesting how I didn't cash my chips in when I should. I figured, let's leave the options open, and if black had castled, then probably I would have reverted back to the correct course. But major kudos to our opponent for, uh, for, for, for castling queenside, which is the correct move. All right. So now I play knight b3, and the reason I put the knight on b3 is because uh, should the queen move away from e7, in response to queen f6, I was intending to circle the knight around to c5 and put pressure on the bishop and the pawn. Our opponent plays c5, which I think is a good move. Okay, queen f3 is very natural. 
uh, threatening bishop takes d5, getting the queen into the game. Our opponent is playing very accurately here. And a4. Also, I would argue a relatively straightforward move. Uh, the idea of this move was born out in the game. I'm just trying to shove the pawn up to a6. Um, according to the computer, the position is now equal, but it certainly doesn't feel equal. h5 is correct. Our opponent initiates his own operation on the king side. Okay, a5. And my secondary idea was that if black freezes the pawn with a6, um, we revert to a positional course of action. Who can tell me the perhaps very unexpected move here, because you might be in attack mode, but one of the things that you have to be able to do in complex positions is very quickly switch between like straightforward attacking play versus suddenly switching to something more positional. Not knight d2. So what you should notice is what has been the effect of this change in pawn structure. It's the fact that the c5 pawn can no longer be defended by the move b6. So it's a simple task of removing the defender. Queen to g3, removing the defender by offering a queen trade. And suddenly, black is in trouble. Because if black takes it, earlier, this would not have been a problem. Black would have just gotten b6. Now, b6, obviously, we just play a, b, and we win. Okay, now, you might say, well, black doesn't have to cooperate. Black can play queen to c6. But now we have kind of the higher ground. We can play h4 to freeze black's pawn. And our rook can come in t5. It should be pretty clear to you that like black's pieces are now super, super awkward. Okay. Uh, so that was the idea. Our opponent plays h4, which is also a pretty good move. And same thing against bishop g4. I intended to play queen g3. One sec, let me refresh. Okay. So I intended to play queen g3. h4, we throw in the move a6. And after b6, I figured that we need to play h3. I didn't want to allow black to play h3 and create long-term weaknesses on the king side. And I think this is actually a, a critical moment. This is where our opponent made a grave, grave error. Knight f4 was a really, really bad move. Really, really bad move. Why is knight f4 a bad move? Well, I think the reason is pretty simple. It opens up these incredible prospects for our queen, and it doesn't actually do anything. The trade of bishops favors white because we are controlling the e-file, and once the e-file opens up, we get another front that we can attack on. I think our opponent kind of panicked here. The correct move, according to the engine, was rook to h6. Rook to h6. And the position is very double-edged, but ultimately equal. What is the idea? Simple. You're getting the rook to f6, chasing away the queen from its optimal post. And according to the computer, one way that the game can end is actually a repetition of moves. Um, can white go for the win with queen e2? Yes. But here black can tuck the king away on b8. And white is running out of active ideas. If you triple, suddenly black drops into f4. And now it's black who's developing this very, very strong attack against g2. Rook h6 was an excellent move. A hard move to find. You can also go king b8 and essentially just keep the tension. And at this very high level, insofar as people do have a weakness at, at the level of like 22, 2300 standard rating, it often is like the inability to keep the tension. They feel like they have to, you know, do something for something rather than playing a slow, methodical move like King B8. And after Knight F4, the real fun begins. The top computer move is absolutely insane. I have zero shame about missing it. And it actually wins the game. The eval is plus three. It's a beautiful move. This move was on my radar for the record, but I didn't appreciate its, its strength. Vacant Pendejo got it. No, someone is proposing rook takes e6, but that... Why? What does that do? Yes, you got it. Uh, rook to e5. Rook to e frickin' 5. All right, immediately highlighting the... I was going to say the badness, like the, the error of knight f4, because now clearly the rook is untouchable, but the point is to slice off the connection between the knight and the queen. So first of all, the knight is hanging, and I actually forgot about this. So the knight is hanging. What happens if the knight moves? Well, if the knight moves, then we're able to take the bishop and ruin black's pawn structure. And we just take on e6, and black's position crumbles immediately. Okay, that's pretty obvious. What else can black do in this position? Well, black can play bishop takes c4 first. Here we simply recapture on c4. And 
Now black can move the knight away, and it may appear that black is okay. But that's an illusion. Let's say black plays knight e6. Now white just plays positionally. The, the basic idea, if you just look at this position without calculating any moves, what is black's next move? What is black about to do? Nothing. There is nothing that black can do because of the power of the pawn on a6 and because of our domination over this long diagonal. Right? This is the power of static advantage. Black can't move the queen. The king has nowhere to go. Black can't really control either of these two squares, and the rook dominates the knight. So we simply build up our initiative. And so if you consider this framework, the next few moves should make sense. Rook a1, get the rook into the game. King b8. Now, which piece is not playing to its full potential? Well, clearly these three pieces are. Well, how about the knight? You might say, oh, let's go knight d2. But no, we won't be able to go knight e4 because the rook will hang knight to c1. Knight to c1, you're getting the knight to d3. And you might say, well, okay, well, what happens after all of that is, is done? So let's just make a couple of random moves for black. Rook g8, knight d3. Let's say black just plays like rook f8. Finally, it's time to convert our domination into concrete action. Pause the video if you're watching on YouTube. The final part of the invasion is also very instructive. It often happens that once all the pieces are optimized, it's time to use the pawns to break apart and actually create invadable points in the opponent, opponent's position. Yeah, b4. b4, we're threatening to take on c5, so black has to take. The knight takes on b4, threatening the fork on c6. Black has to defend. And now look at this, c5. Again, we're trying to open the b file. If bc, then we just go rook b1 with decisive threats. If black plays knight takes c5, then... Well, the seventh rank has been open. Rook e7, knight d7, and knight to d5. Look at this. I mean, just total, complete, and utter domination. And some beautiful lines. If queen to d6, knight to f6, threatening mate on b7, knight to c5, black has to defend, rook b7 check, and the game ends. If black plays rook c7 here, then it's a lot less glorious. You just play rook e8 check and checkmate on b7. If black plays queen to c6 here, then the line is also not very glorious. You can just win with rook takes d7 and bring the other rook to e7. You can also do this against queen to d6, by the way. Queen to c6. And now, wow. Incredible idea. Queen f4 check, king a8. And now, an amazing move. A beautiful move, even though it doesn't sacrifice anything. Who can spot the idea? Incredible move, very instructive. No, 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 don't just randomly sack knight b6 a b, that's nothing. I think a lot of you watching on YouTube really want to go knight c7 check right now. But knight c7 is less convincing, black can actually take and the game goes on. So the idea here is that, what's the mating square? Well, the mating square is b7. Well, how do we get to b7? Well, one way to get to b7 would be to open up somehow the long diagonal if we can get the queen away from the long diagonal, our queen can jump to f3. So the correct move is a retreating knight move, knight to b4. And the intention is simple. The queen has no squares along this diagonal. Every square is covered, literally. No matter where the queen moves, we will either have f3 or e4 with checkmate on b7. If black plays g5, you can actually still take the queen and deliver Arabian mate. How about that line? Let's go through that one more time. Okay, the correct move is rook e5, tactics. And once black takes and goes knight e6, there's the build-up phase where we bring our rook in or bring our knight in. Then the opening up the opposing side's king phase, b4. And then the decisive invasion using sacrifices to open up new pathways, particularly for our heavy pieces. c5, knight c5, rook e7, getting the knight in. And here we can also play rook takes d7 or knight f6. And then the final tactical stage leading to checkmate. Okay, that was a long analysis. This is going to be a long video, but I really, really think this game is super instructive. And I hope you enjoyed that, uh, that analysis. Okay, so in the game, I played knight to d2. And hopefully you don't blame me for this. I had the right general concept of making relatively slow improvements. I just didn't see Ricky 5. Okay, so g5 by our opponent. He sticks to his guns. By the way, if we play rook to e5 in this position, it's not as good because black can drop the bishop back to d7. And now the knight is no longer hanging. 
So that ship has sailed. I played bishop takes e6 check, uh, f takes e6. And now once again, rook e5 is best. But knight c4 is also quite good, completing the maneuver. Our opponent should have played rook h to f8 and try to create counterplay against the queen. Instead, he went king b8. But obviously, this does not help the cause because queen b7 is still mate. Now rook a3. Computer does not love this move. What was the idea? Well, the idea is to set up the threat of knight takes b6. I considered this move immediately, and this is what was taking me so long. I was like looking at all these tactical moves, and they never seem to work. Because like a, b, a7 is just winning. After queen b6, rook a3, it looks really good, but black can just make a run for it. King c7, rook b3, queen takes a6, and the attack fizzles out. We no longer have the b7 square. Okay, so that's why I decided to prepare with rook a3. Again, according to the engine, the correct approach was just to double on the e-file. Like, this is always what the computer likes doing, playing, like, super, super slowly, and then, like, getting the knight around to b5. But I wanted to mate him immediately. Rook a3, not a bad move, actually. And uh, king c8, I think, is a very decent defense. Now rook b3, reinforcing the potential idea of knight takes b6 check. Okay. So I'm not giving you all the engine moves here. Like here, according to the engine, rook h f8 maintained good defensive chances, but that's not the point of this analysis. He plays rook d f8, queen e4. Queen e4, again, according to the engine, is a mistake. Uh, the correct approach would have been to give a check first on a8 and then come back to e4. And the reason is not what you might think. The reason you give this check is actually very, very deep. Now let's for a moment take the defensive side here. So far, our opponent has been defending very well. Now, when you're defending for a long time, it's very, very important not to miss the opportunity when you can launch a counterattack. Oftentimes, when the opposing side, the attacking side, keeps attacking, keeps attacking, it's very, very easy to forget that your own king may eventually end up being vulnerable. And I think our opponent lost this game because he missed, ultimately missed the opportunity to create counterplay against our king. And this was the moment to do it. The correct move was g4. Yeah, g4 h takes g4, and suddenly, after h3, it turns out that white's king is under serious fire. I thought that I could play g3, but now suddenly, h2 check and knight h3, and f2 is hanging, and believe it or not, this is a draw. It's a crazy draw. Queen takes e6, king b8. Knight takes b6. White's got some tricks in the bag, too. Knight takes f2, check king g2. Now, not promote, because white just takes it. You take the knight. Rook takes b6, king a7, not king a8 because of queen to d5 check and then check on b7, check on b7, queen takes pawn takes, things are starting to fizzle out, h1 queen, takes takes, black has a thousand pieces for the queen, and so white has to force perpetual check, like this, and then just like the checks along the 6th rank, because black is also threatening the devastating rook f2. Very simple line, yeah. Very. How did we both not spot this instantly? But what's what's the subtlety? Why should we have forced the king to d7? And yes, the king is more vulnerable here, but what specifically is the idea of the check on a8? Who can tell me? Okay, now I'm, I'm kind of spoon-feeding you this. Yeah, very good. 95 check stops the counterplay, and you can just pick up the pawn on g4. And that knight keeps the king completely safe. Yeah, uh, again, how did I not see that? Our opponent misses the chance. He, he tries to make one more preparatory move. And that gives me the chance now to strike first. Now I set up the threat of knight takes b6. And g4 comes a little bit too late because I'm able to play knight takes b6. He has to take a7. And very importantly, we have enough eyes on the a8 square. If king d7 were able to promote and we just emerge with an extra exchange. Black is just not, just not fast enough. If, if he takes, we make a second queen. And that's obviously checkmate. No, g takes h3. Where? But he doesn't have time for g takes h3. If he plays it here, we can give this check. Black is just not in time. Any questions about this? So our opponent was alert. He makes a run for it to d7. Apparently king to d8 was better. Now 95 check centralizing the knight. And now I'm really proud of the move rookie one, just getting the rook back to the center, solidifying everything, and just keeping the tension. And now I found the correct move, c3. All of the pieces have been optimized, just like in that line where the knight got to d3. 
when all of your pieces are optimally placed, it's often a sign that you need to change the pawn structure. You need to introduce a new element of pressure. And often that means using the pawns to kind of carve out new avenues for your pieces. That's what led me to c3. It's really the only feasible breakthrough. And black's position crumbles immediately. dc, rook takes c3. Right. The point here is not to maintain your pawn structure, it's to get your pieces into the game. This sets up more threats of, of breakthroughs. And now the final stage, rook to b8. Okay, b4 is good. I'm just checking with the engine if I played decently. d4 is correct, queen c8. dc is correct. b4 is the second best move. Knight c4 check also winning. Rook b5, bc, rook c5. And uh, yeah, I actually played correctly. Queen d4 takes a knight c4. One other thing, if black had gone king e7, there was a very important detail. I spotted this detail. How does white win in the most efficient way? How does white win in the most efficient way here? Okay, very good. All right, very good. Knight 2, c6 check, king f6, and simply knight takes a7. Another concept that I've highlighted a lot, which is that you want to avoid getting into checkmate mode where all you're looking for is some sort of sacrifice or mate. Remember that we haven't actually sacked anything. We can just take all of black's pieces. That is a completely viable way of winning the game. Queen a6, just take on b5, just push the damn pawn and make another queen. All right, so, so don't stop looking for ways to win material just because your primary goal is to attack the king. Rook takes c5, queen d4 check. Now, if rook to d5, uh, then we can win in a variety of ways, but... The absolute simplest is probably, okay, queen b4 check is winning. Um, the, yeah, queen b4 check, rook to c5, rook to d1 check, knight to d5. It's crazy how resiliently he defended. Now we take on c5. Wow. Knight c4 check, beautiful. King c6, knight a5 check, and the knight circles around to b7 of the fork. That's the most efficient win. Knight c4, knight a5, knight b7. Actually, wait, no, queen b7 is mate. Queen b7 is mate in one. But this is a beautiful idea nonetheless. And finally, finally, we take on c5. Another retreating knight move. And here, the final detail is that I have this move knight d6 check, which, which ends the game. Then we can... Well, actually, the king can't even get to the fourth rank. Black loses all of his pieces. And that's that. Okay, he gave up the queen, but the rest, the rest is... Clear without further commentary. Whew. That's the game, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, this is why the Rui Lopez is so much fun, because you get games like this. It's it's a very rich opening. Knight d4 is a very rich line, actually. A little bit underrated. It's it's easy for white to, to laugh at this move, but as you can see, there's a lot of meat on the bone. So to conclude, I did manage to find all the right moves at the start. But the key was to cash in, to go for the positional advantage when you got a chance. Of course, I missed Long Castle. That started the fun. And then one of the main takeaways, one of the main themes of this game is that even when you're attacking, you have to be able to kind of slow down. You have to have various gears. And you can't beat a good player with just one gear. Like, you can't be in go mode the entire time. And you have to be able to pause and say, wait a second, now it's time to slowly accumulate the attack by improving my pieces. And we saw that at several points in this game. Of course, rook e5 is brilliant. We, we saw this here with rook a to e1 and the knight c1 to d3. And we saw this also in the game where I was ultimately able to win because I just sort of, okay, I made a lot of mistakes, but ultimately I was just able to bring my rook to e1, prepare the attack, and then open up the center with c3. Okay, I could probably talk about this game for another hour, but... Uh, the time has come for us to end. I'm exhausted. This has turned out into a long video. I wasn't really planning for that, but I got really, really into the game. Uh, so this will be up on YouTube pretty soon. Thanks, everybody. Happy holidays. Hope you get to spend some time with your family uh, and your loved ones. Thank you for all of the support, everybody. This was a really fun stream. And I will see you guys later. Have a good one.